Good evening and welcome to our COVID-19 update. I am Ladi Akari Dulwale. Here are the highlights at this hour. President Buhari asks international community to share research knowledge of COVID-19 virus with others. Low compliance level for COVID-19 containment measures continue to feature across states in Nigeria. And World Health Organization welcomes the new drug, dexamethasone, but cautions on its use. We're starting off tonight in Abuja, where the President, Mohamed Buhari, is asking the international community to support collaboration and initiatives aimed at sharing knowledge from research and science to fight the coronavirus pandemic. The president spoke earlier today at a virtual extraordinary China-Africa summit on solidarity against the COVID-19 virus, co-hosted by the Forum for China-Africa Cooperation, FOCAC. He also told the summit that Nigeria would support any joint and collective action plan aimed at regional or global levels to tackle the COVID-19 pandemic and its fallout. The summit was co-hosted by the Chinese president, Xi Jinping, the South African leader and AU chairperson, Cyril Ramposa, and Senegal's president and co-chair, Fokak Maki Sal. A common pervasive and invisible enemy, it is important that we all remain united to save our shared humanity because this virus knows no borders. The fight against a global pandemic that continues to take so many lives, threaten livelihoods, and challenging the very public of societies requires enhanced cooperation and worldwide solidarity. Excellencies, I see this opportunity to reiterate the need to this summit to put humanity at the center of our vision for common prosperity. We must learn lessons and share knowledge from research as we develop more creative, responsive, and humane health systems, improve crisis management protocols, and support each other in the battle against COVID-19. Nigeria supports and will join any joint and collaborative action plan of regional and global levels to tackle this pandemic and its fallout. In these, in these endeavors, we must not fail because the lives and livelihood of our peoples depend on our collective efforts. President Mohamed Buhari. The Jigar state government says it will close down the 240-bed capacity isolation center in Afghanistan following the successes recorded in the fight against COVID-19 in that state. The Commissioner of Health, Dr. Abba Zakari, who confirmed this to newsmen in Dutse, the state capital, says the state has only eight active cases out of the 317 initially recorded, as 257 have recovered and have been discharged. 43 have returned to their various states, while nine have died so far. This, according to the commissioner, makes it necessary to close down the isolation center as it would be a waste of resources to continue with its operations. Most of these uh, other cases that uh, are not within our isolation facilities, uh, most of them, I mean, I mean, we follow all of them and we also test them. But there are many of them also that uh, uh, are not from the states. They are passers by, maybe they are intercepted at the, at the borders. You know, we test them, uh, when we test them, and then they choose to go back to their state uh, to go and get uh, uh, medication. So you can see that difference will be covered by, uh, by those numbers. Uh, so currently we only have uh, only eight, eight patients uh, in our isolation center. And hopefully also um, uh, those patients, we will take their samples for testing towards the end of the week to see also if uh, they have turned uh, negative. And with this, you can see that our isolation center in Fanisau uh, has about 240 bed capacity. 
and as of now we only have five patients in that center. So um, it doesn't make any sense to, I mean, continue operating that center for now. Um, so what we intend to do is, uh, the moment uh, these patients uh, are discharged, um, we will temporarily close that center. And we hope that uh, we may not have the cost to uh, reopen it. Meanwhile, in Adamawa State, the government there says it has successfully treated all its COVID-19 patients. The state's commissioner for health mentioned this at the Infectious Disease Center in Yola, the capital. He reveals that of the 374 samples tested for the coronavirus disease, only 42 turned out positive. Since Adamawa State in the Northeast recorded its index case of coronavirus in April this year, the state has put in place some measures to contain the pandemic. The result of these efforts is now evident as the state government frontline workers gather at the Yola Specialist Hospital to celebrate 42 survivors of the pandemic. One of the discharged patients tells her story. My travel to a specialist hospital isolation center was an eye-opening experience to the fact that COVID-19 is real. With the help of the healthcare workers, three days after administration, I start feeling immediate improvement in my well-being. My breathing becomes smoother, and my temperature, which was 39.5 earlier, came down to 37.3. That's not all. Health authorities in the state also confirm that there are no more infections in the state. As of today, the state has tested over 374 cases. Out of this, 42 turned out to be positive, giving a percentage of 11.2, while 313, uh, that is 84 percent, tested negative to COVID-19, while 19, 5 percent are still pending. As we speak today, uh, we don't have a single case on admission in our isolation center. The last case that was tested positive uh, was 16 days ago. And the state government wants to build on this success to keep a clean slate, appealing to residents to observe all protocols against COVID-19 to avoid a re-entry into the state. Let's look at the story out of Adamawa State in a bit more detail. I'm being joined uh, via Skype from uh, Yola by the chairman of the state's task force on COVID-19, the secretary to the state government, uh, Engineer Bashir Ahmed. Good evening, uh, Engineer Ahmed. Uh, thank you for your time and thank you for joining us uh, this evening. A number of people will talk about the fact that this is a success, the fact that you do not have any active cases. But then how much testing are you still doing in the wake of this? Is the state continuing to test people? Because that's where the real issue would be. Thank you very much and uh, happy to be with you. Uh, yes, as of today, or as, as at uh, Monday, as two days ago, all the patients that we had in the treatment center have all been discharged. As for whether testing is continuing, yes, testing is continuing, but not random testing. We are only testing based on the advice by the World Health Organization. Uh, so we're only taking tests, we will conduct tests on suspects where we get alerts from the community uh, as to those who have shown symptoms. Given, given the position that you've expressed uh, about doing tests only when uh, you receive alerts or people present themselves uh, possibly with symptoms, uh, the next logical question would then be, what is the level of compliance with uh, the containment measures in Adamawa State. In many of the other states uh, that we have been following, the level of compliance is particularly low. Would you say this is the same in Adamawa State? 
I would say the level of compliance is fairly okay, even though it may not be as high as we expect. But it is that fair compliance that actually has contributed quite immensely to the success uh, of the containment uh, exercise. Because if that had not been uh, successful, or if the compliance was very low, we might still have been recording uh, uh, positive cases. But just as uh, the Commissioner of Health mentioned earlier, we had suspected cases, 374, out of which only 42 tested positive. And we had about 409 contacts that we were following up, all of which, all of whom exited 409 without a single positive case. So by our assessment, the level of uh, the presence or prevalence of the uh, virus within our communities is, was very low or is very low. And uh, we believe that uh, the outcome, as it is right now, is actually what it is in our communities. And we have no fears that this is the actual position. There is in place an interstate travel ban, uh, but reports, of course, indicate that in many parts of the country, this ban has been flouted and continues uh, to be flouted. Uh, have, have you experienced any of that in Adama State, people coming in from outside uh, the state? Because in, uh, in our report, the Commissioner for Health did allude to some of that by saying, you know, people passing by or who were intercepted at the border were amongst those who were tested. Yes, um, Adama, of course, cannot be an exception to uh, people flouting uh, rules or regulations. So yes, we've, we also have a fair share of those who have come in, notwithstanding the interstate border closure. And uh, yes, as the Commissioner mentioned, some of the positive cases we had were actually as a result of uh, those who have come in. To be candid, even the index case we had in Adama State was a, was a suspect who actually came into Yola when there was supposed to be a lockdown, both from where he took off and two other states, and finally in Adama. Uh, so yes, uh, people have actually come into the state, uh, notwithstanding border closures. But that notwithstanding, the, the campaign that we had and sustained for a very long time at the very early stage of this infection, when many people in, let me say, in the North believe or strongly believe that this thing does not exist, the state, the, our governor, came first to say we should not joke about this. We were about the first to set up uh, an isolation center in the whole of northern Nigeria. And also, the governor, our governor, is the first to inaugurate a containment committee. I think those uh, proactive steps actually put us in good stead to have succeeded in containing this uh, disease. Thank you very much, uh, Engineer uh, Bashir. Ahmed, uh, Chairman of the COVID-19 uh, Task Force in Adamawa State and Secretary to the State Government. We wish you every success in keeping the record clean uh, as we move ahead uh, on COVID-19. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Good night. Moving on to Quara State, where most people there are not complying with the COVID-19 guidelines, especially as it relates to wearing of face masks as well as the observance of social distancing. The markets and banks are the worst hit as people did not follow the guidelines, while others are calling for stiffer uh, implementation to force the people. Ilori, the Kwara State capital, north central Nigeria, residents are going about their normal activities without paying much attention to the guidelines on COVID-19. At the markets, physical distancing is a huge challenge. Residents transact businesses oblivious of the unseen danger. 
Only a handful of people are using face masks, with traders and customers not bothered. At the banks, social distancing is also not in existence, as customers throng the banking premises to transact their businesses. As citizens, what we need to do is to comply with the directive of the, of the government. There's nothing government can, can, can do. Government even seems a place at this time, but they shouldn't do that. They should continue to ensure that there is enforcement of all the directives that they are given in order to uh, elicit the necessary reaction. Other residents explain that the relaxation of the lockdown and doubt over the existence of the pandemic could be some of the factors responsible for non-observance of the COVID-19 guidelines. They call on the various governments to strictly enforce them. We hardly comply with rules, except we are being enforced. Initially, when the issue of uh, face masks becomes a law, it was somehow enforced. So they are saying that security agents will have to send somebody back or drop people from a vehicle because they are not using their face masks. But all of that has been relaxed. Nevertheless, most offices visited are complying with the provision of hand-washing facilities and sanitizers, a major step towards protecting residents and ensure there's no community transmission of the virus. In Nasarawa State, but still in the North Central region, the level of compliance with COVID-19 guidelines is also very low as residents move about their businesses without the use of face masks and definitely no social distancing. Our correspondent, Halima Gayam, has that update. The announcement of the relaxation of the COVID-19 containment restrictions in Nasarawa State appears to residents as though the virus has vanished. They go about their businesses normally as if the world is out of the woods yet. They are not adhering to safety guidelines. They are unmindful of the fact that the virus is still very much around. The use of face masks, which is one of the safest beds for protection, is taken for granted. Only a very few are complying, even as authorities have made it compulsory. Uh, we pray that government to come to our rescue and God will help us too. Because even me, I'm not used to wear this face mask. I find it difficult to wear it. However, the government has commenced sensitizing the people on the importance of staying safe. Uh, with the pandemic that is going on right now, His Excellency is concerned about his citizen. Despite um, the lockdown is off, it, it wants to constantly create the awareness so that people can continue, despite the, uh, the fact that they are going out, they can continue to stay safe and, and, and be safe. So that's the purpose we are here today, more to educate them about social distancing and secondly uh, for them to be aware what it means if they're in the crowd what they need to do and what they need not to do government's efforts at sensitizing the people will not be successful if the people do not take responsibility of their personal safety the people will have to strike a balance between livelihood and health halima gayam for covid 19 updates Thank you very much, Halima. We'll take a break. When we come back, we'll continue with the rounds of seeing what some of the states are doing with regards to this compliance. And now we'll talk to a public health physician on what could be the implications of all of this. Please stay on with us. Thanks for staying tuned. Welcome back to our COVID-19 update. Many people in Kaduna State are still not wearing face masks in public places, nor observing physical distancing in spite of official directives by government which criminalizes such acts. This is also coming after the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19 has appealed to Nigerians to avoid the risks of not complying with the guidelines on COVID-19. Commercial activities return to Kaduna State following the relaxation of the indefinite lockdown imposed by the state government in the wake of COVID-19. As noticed in most places, COVID-19 has changed the way of life and how activities are conducted, especially in public places. A call at some markets in Kaduna 
however, gives you a sense of worry as regards compliance to safety. Despite the law making it compulsory to wear a face mask, some folks can't be bothered. I've lived my life, I can't use face mask because if I wear face masks, I see if I don't use to breathe well. I'm not scared because I, I can't contact the disease. Because when you, feel, when you believe that you can contact the disease, that's the only way you can contact the disease. Numbers are increasing. Bed spaces are being taken up at isolation centers. The virus doesn't have any clinical cure yet, making it a worrisome situation to find such compromises. Most Nigerians are skeptical of what is happening because of the government stance. People have lost confidence in what they hear and it appears to some of them that this thing is not real. But to be candid, I believe COVID-19 is real. The prevailing belief that because many people do not exhibit symptoms, therefore the virus is not contagious, is also a great source of concern. But as the pandemic increases across the country, health officials and governments are still worried about the behavior of most people in adhering to simple protocols that will keep them safe and alive. In South South uh, Nigeria, some traders dealing in non-essential commodities in Benin City, the Edo State Capital, have returned to their business places ahead of any directive from the state government asking them to reopen their doors. One of the traders explained that he had undergone screening for COVID-19 and felt fit and ready to resume business. A transport line operator in the state who awaits government's review of the directives on interstate travel, passengers could be protected when the ban is lifted. Let's bring you up to date on uh, the figures uh, for COVID-19 uh, for today. 17,148 is the figure representing the total number of confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Nigeria as at this moment. Of this number, 11,070 are the active cases because 5,623 patients have been successfully treated and discharged while the number of deaths has risen to 455. Let's take a look at the figures by region. The Southwest tops the regions uh, with 8,802 cases. Lagos has 7,461 of those. The Northwest follows with 2,635 confirmed cases and Kano State accounts for 1,158 of those cases. The Federal Capital Territory holds 1,324 cases the highest in the North Central. Over in the South South, the region has 1,702 confirmed cases and River State leads here with 631 cases. The Northeast has 1,431 cases, Borno having 445 of those figures. At the bottom of the list uh, is the Southeast, which accounts for a total of 636 cases and Abia State tops that region uh, with 173 cases. Let's talk to uh, Mrs. Adefola Keadini, who is the national treasurer. She's also a pharmacist of the Pharmaceutical Society of Nigeria. Thank you, madam, for coming in. Thank you. Good evening. I suppose it is good news. Uh, it should be regarded as good news that uh, a drug has been found which potentially treats uh, very seriously ill patients, uh, reduces the mortality or fatality rate amongst them. Is that, is it? Well, um, thank you. I was also quite um, impressed when I heard the news that uh, the examitazone, because that's the name of the drug, uh, which is a steroid, um, and it's been used for a long time, since the 1960s, to treat inflammatory conditions in patients, um, you know, for skin diseases. It's a, it's a synthetic drug, actually. Um, which um, is very similar to um, cortisol, okay. which is a naturally occurring hormone in the body. And uh, this um, hormone reduces inflammation and uh, also reduces the activity of the immune system. And it's been found to be used in so many cases of um, skin disorders, um, respiratory um, conditions 
So, um, you know, you, as you rightly said, is being is now being used for critically ill COVID-19 patients. It's not just for any anybody who has tested positive, because we need to make this clear, because we know the environment we live in, that as soon as we hear that a drug has been found to treat any condition, people will just latch on it and start using it. It's for critically ill patients, patients who are on oxygen, COVID-19 patients, who are on oxygen or on, respira on respirators. What so, we call ventilators. Ventilators, yes. So we need to be very careful. It's very encouraging because uh, we know this is a novel con um, disease, virus. So, um, and everybody is um, trying to find one treatment or the other yeah. so that we can reduce the mortality rate in COVID-19 patients. Do you think there's any link between the fact that people believed or people believe that at some point we will come up with some kind of solution like this, which is why they may not be taking the issue of the guidelines and the protocols that have been put in place so seriously? Because the reports we're getting from virtually everywhere in the country is that is business as usual. Everybody has gone back to uh, life as we knew it before COVID-19. I quite agree with you. You need to get to the market and you see that everybody, uh, I was alarmed the last time I was at the market and it was, I looked around, it was like I was the only person putting on mask. And I was like, ah, what is happening here? Because so many people do believe it's just, maybe it's just malaria because of the, you know, symptom, which is fever, you know, high temperature and um, maybe fever. Um, weakness. So they feel it's just ordinary malaria that is, but it is not from what we have, um, we have all the researches that are being done. We know that it, this is a different virus. The COVID-19 virus is a different one. And people need to take it seriously because a lot of people are still coming up with it. We have the community transmission now and we need to be very careful. The use of face masks cannot be overemphasized and uh, people need to know that this is not just a propaganda, it is real. And um, you people surface... are saying, sorry to interrupt, but people are saying, well, we, you've been talking about this uh, COVID-19 since uh, sometime in February, uh, they've been hearing about you, but many of them point out in some of the reports, they point out that they don't know anybody who has, they don't know anybody who has had, who has had it. Okay. They don't know anybody who knows anybody who has had it and so on. And that the numbers, that they are not seeing any dead bodies. They don't see people being buried like they see in some other countries, countries. and so on. Again, is this an issue of perception vis-a-vis -vis what is really going on? That those who know what is going on know but may not be able to or are not communicating uh, to those who may not know. I think that I quite agree with you. The issue is that, you know, when those who have had this virus, who have been treated, who have come out, they are not coming out openly to say, I have gone through it, except a few people. Right. They are not coming out to say it. And government is also not giving out names because of the, you know, stigmatization that is attached to it, and, uh, which is very unfortunate. If um, we have been able to get some names, see people who really come out, because I'm aware of a few people who have gone through it and have come out and have been, you know, treated and they have, you know, they are fine today. But maybe because I'm also in the health sector, so yes. I see it and I know it's real. But those who are outside, they are like, who are these people? We have not seen anybody. Nobody has come out. We have just been seeing figures and figures. But in reality, they need to, maybe for those who have been to the isolation centers, they will really believe that this thing is real. And um, we need to take it seriously because the infection, we can see that even in Lagos State, all, all over the country, we are still having increase in the number of um, COVID-19 every, every day, especially in Lagos. And Lagos, because of the uh, population of, this, of Lagos, that's, I'm sure that's why we are, it's the epicenter of Nigeria, actually. And we need to, I think uh, the awareness is being created, but it's like people feel... No, it's a propaganda, they are trying to make money. But I want to disabuse their mind that it is real. We all need to still take the precautions seriously. Wear a face mask when we go out. And uh, hand washing, it's better to wash with your water and soap. When that is not available, then use the 
um, hand sanitizer, 70% alcohol based to wash your hand. And this physical distances or social distance, as we call it, should always be encouraged. Uh, we can see that Lagos State government has put in, you know, this uh, opening of churches and it, uh, it has put, put it Lagos State has put it on hold because of the increase that we are having. So people need to be, they need to become aware and know that it is, it is not just a propaganda. It is a real thing and we need to take it seriously because um, the casualty is also increasing. So it can be anybody. You don't need to wait until it gets to you before you be believe that it is real. Thank you so very much. Uh, pharmacist Adefalake Adeni, mm -hmm. thank you so much for being our guest tonight. Thank you so okay. much for coming in. Thank you. It's been our pleasure to have you with us. Okay. Let's go now uh, to Amowo Dauphin area of Lagos, uh, where Dr. Modukbe Akinka, a public health physician, joins us via Skype. Uh, Dr. Akinka, welcome. Thank you for your time this evening. Thank you very much for having me on the program. Good evening. It's sounding like uh, some sort of recurring decimal now. Uh, the last time you were on this show, uh, we talked about the issue of non-compliance. People are still not complying, whether it's from Kaduna, you're talking, or from uh, Damawa, or from Jigawa, or from Kwara, or indeed any of the other states uh, from which we, ha we have had reports uh, very recently. And I've just finished speaking to uh, pharmacist uh, Adeni, and she says that it seems as if there's still this, the bottom and the top dichotomy, that enough is not being done to let those at the bottom know that this is all uh, too real. Do you still think this is the case? I think a lot, a great deal still needs to be done as per engagement and as per enlightenment. So I, I really think that is also part of the case because we find that at the grassroots, the perception of the risk is not really there. You know, people feel, oh, it's just some imported thing and it doesn't concern me, you know. It concerns just people of um, high socioeconomic status or some don't even believe at all that it exists. So we, we still need deeper engagement with the grassroots, with at the local government level, whereby people can you know, people can, the, the community development associations can speak to their people. You know, the local government chairman, chairman, and then the people at the local government, you know, can speak to people, engage people, the heads of the um, associations, and speak to their people and communicate this fact that this disease is real and it's here. And then, of course, the media also needs to help us doing to do that because we need to get this thing to the to the language that the people speak. And then, not just that, but to also focus on some of the people that have come out of it. I know um, STV has done something going to the going to the isolation centers and actually talking to people in isolation. All right, so making it making it more real to people and making people know that this this disease is actually here and that there is a risk for every person and we all have to protect ourselves so that we don't become casualties in this um, pandemic. Having said that much, uh, the situation with the new, uh, some people say it's a wonder drug, others are saying it's not so wonder because it's been around since the 60s. Uh, do you think this, the, the arrival or the discovery, quote and unquote, of this drug uh, and its use for COVID-19 may induce some sort of complacency uh, in the battle to, uh, to contain it? Now, the thing with dexamethasone is that dexamethasone, like you said, has been around for, for a long time now. And it's, it's not like it's a wonder drug like that. What dexamethasone has been found to do with COVID-19 is that in the people that have had it and their cases are really severe, it has reduced the death rate because part of the physiology or the pathophysiology of the disease is that the person's body 
what the fighting that is going on within the person's body, trying to get rid of the virus, is actually part of what now causes problems for the person and can cause death in many people. And so when they use dexamethasone, it is for those people that have been hospitalized, those people that are having, you know, challenges with breathing, that are probably on ventilators already, all right? So it doesn't mean now that people should now go and start taking dexamethasone and say, oh, one that drug has been found and then they start taking it. That's going to lead to, you know, so many problems because dexamethasone is a steroid. is not meant to be taken like that. In fact, it can even reduce your immunity if you take it. And everybody needs a strong immune system at this point in time. So dexamethasone is a drug that is meant to be prescribed by a doctor in a hospital setting. And that's what it has been found to do, to reduce the death rate from COVID-19. So we need to pass that message across to people so that we don't now start finding people taking dexamethasone the way they were taking chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine and creating numerous problems, you know, greater problems than what we even have on ground. Looking ahead now, given everything that we now know about the containment efforts and what else there is, uh, given the situation that as we have it now, uh, where exactly would you place what we are, what we are now to expect? Because the cases are rising, albeit slowly, but they are rising steadily uh, 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 on a daily basis. Uh, and the connect between that and the fact that the protocols are not being complied with is still not being understood. So I know you've talked about bring it down to the community level. Many more people need to be involved. But in terms of uh, interventions uh, for those who may have wanted to comply but who don't have the means, what else can, could, could, could we still be doing? Practically everybody needs, has the means to be able to comply because what we're talking about is, you know, those um, strategies, physically distancing from next person. I can physically distance from next person. And if I cannot even do that, then I wear a face mask. I'm wearing a face mask. I'm washing my hands regularly. It's, it's a personal responsibility thing. Each person needs to take personal responsibility. And then apart from that, for example, when you go to the market and the woman you want to buy, or the, 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 the seller you want to buy from is not wearing a mask, then you tell the person, if you don't wear a mask, I'm not going to buy from you. All right? If we all start you know, putting that out, if you, you want to enter or you want to go in to a bus, public transportation, and the buses say, if you're not wearing a mask, sorry, I can't take you. Or your Uber says, if you're not wearing a mask, I will not pick you. Right? So we need to, each one needs to also take that responsibility and then make sure that the people around you are also taking responsibility. And at the same time, also, those of us that do know about it should engage with these people that think that there is no COVID-19 because we know people that have had it. And then we know, we, we can see from the news, people that have died from this disease. So it's not a joke at all. And people really need to know that and take responsibility. Because if anybody, like I have said before, at the point in time, if anybody gets ill from COVID-19, government is not the one that is going to suffer. It is that individual and the person's family. So each person needs to take that responsibility and be sure that we're protecting ourselves. Because even if they are asymptomatic and they, you know, they, they do not come up with symptoms, what of the people in their houses? They will have people that are vulnerable around them. They will have people with comorbidities around them and they will then transmit to those people and then what happens to those people. So we really, really need to make sure we do this or else the cases like we're seeing, definitely they will continue to rise. But if we do not do this, you know, take this responsibility, then what will happen is that our health system will be overwhelmed and we don't want that, God forbid that that should happen. Because that means that even people that would have ordinarily been saved would just die unnecessarily. So we, each person needs to you know, take that responsibility. Thank you so very much, Dr. Akinyenka. Uh, 
we once again will be hoping that those who are involved are listening. Uh, Dr. Mudupaki Yenka is a public health physician. She joins us uh, via Skype uh, from the Amuwa-Dolphin area of Lagos. Thank you so much uh, for your time. Thank you for having me on the program. American-born radio broadcaster, the man popularly known as Dan Forster, is dead. According to reports, Mr. Forster is said to have died of a suspected coronavirus complication. He was a popular voice on some of the radio stations, particularly in Lagos, where he lived since the year 2000 until his death. Uh, that year, that is the year 2000, uh, Dan Foster chose to settle in Lagos and change the history of radio presenting in the country. He was a huge influence on Nigerian radio from that time. And he obviously touched a lot of lives. I think we can go now to... Uh, South Africa for our uh, update at this point in time. Uh, we're joined by our Bureau Chief uh, in Johannesburg, uh, Betty Dibia. Good evening, Betty. Uh, the President, uh, Cyril Ramaphosa, uh, just got off yet another speech to the nation today. What did he have to say? Well, today marks, uh, thank you for having me, Ladi. Uh, today marks 100 days since the index case was recorded in the country. So he used the speech uh, this night to talk about the progress they have made and um, uh, plans to improve the lives. He, he, he also gave details of what is called the advanced level three, meaning more sectors that were not allowed under level three uh, will now be allowed, like the restaurants for you to sit in to have uh, your food and the theaters, the cinemas, you can go in there now. But the date is yet to be announced, but it's going to be probably in a few days. He also pushed it back to the people that at the end of the day, the responsibility of the people to comply with the regulations or the safety measures is what will, will, will make a difference. Uh, today, the country stands at 80,000 412 confirmed cases, although 44,331 are recovered cases. The death toll, unfortunately, is 1,674. Uh, but he says that with all that has been done and with the lockdown that they've had, uh, it's reduced the, the doubling time of, of the number of confirmed cases from two days to 12, between 12 and 15 days. So he's still uh, pleading to people uh, to comply with all the regulations or with, with the safety measures uh, so that uh, people can uh, uh, get out, the country can get out of it because this has had a, a huge impact, not just on the lives of the people, but the economy as well. Brings up the big elephant in the room, which is the issue of compliance. Uh, we've been discussing about that uh, here in Nigeria. What's the level of compliance like? Uh, one would want to assume that it's been quite good if the levels are improving and more and more people are allowed to come out. Is that true? Well, um, the, the relatively, I guess it's, it's been okay. Uh, the, the minibus taxis, that's the commercial transport services, uh, the government has been uh, policing them. So you have a 70 percent um, uh, capacity. They, they can't take full buses to go out. Uh, the, the spraying, using sanitizers within, whoever goes in has to be sprayed. And, and queuing uh, 1.5 meters apart at the, at the shopping places, uh, it's become the norm. People wearing masks, although you have a handful of people who do not comply. And then again, what people do outside is different from what they do within, uh, within their homes or their living uh, places. That's where sometimes you have uh, the, the where probably many people uh, defy the regulations. And then again, uh, the the businesses now, although cigarette is still out, the the, the businesses now allowed. Many people were defying the regulations under. They were not complying. Where you have the hairdressers and the the other beauty. Uh, um, service providers going underground to go provide these services and define the regulations. But now that they're allowed, probably they, they will be out there. But the president is um, hopeful that people will comply more, and uh, especially with the breakthrough drug in the UK, which is manufactured here as well, and it's, it, it's uh, uh, amply available. That's uh, dexamethasone, that help 
Well, maybe the pronunciation of that, uh, but um, they're hopeful that people will comply more uh, and, and then uh, things will get better. But the numbers are still high and could be higher, especially with the temperatures dropping in the country. Well, dexamethasone is a name that we're going to have to learn how to pronounce. Uh, started practicing exactly. that uh, yesterday. Thank you so much, uh, <laughs> Betty, uh, for uh, your update on the Thank program tonight. Thank you very much, Laddie. The World Health Organization has cautioned on the use of dexamethasone, the cheap and widely available drug that can help save patients seriously ill with uh, COVID-19. The head of the WHO's emergencies program, uh, Dr. Mike Ryan, says it is important to reserve the use of the drug for the treatment only of serious cases of COVID-19, for which it has been shown to have a benefit. Uh, COVID-19 cases continue to spike in the United States in the meantime, as experts find that new patients uh, from Beijing in China are experiencing strange symptoms, including joint and stomach discomfort. There are currently 38 NCDC molecular labs in Nigeria with a capacity to test for COVID-19. Find out the details of where they are uh, on the website of the Nigeria Center for Disease Control. The health agency is also asking you to please observe physical distancing by keeping a distance of two meters from the next person, uh, wherever it is that you are. It is better to worship at home, it says, and avoid mass gatherings to reduce the risk of exposure to COVID-19. A visit to the website of the WHO affords you the opportunity of seeing efforts by various countries around the world aimed at tackling the global pandemic. Our website, channelstv.com, has details of all these stories and indeed others. I am Ladi Akiri Duluali. Good night.